uh, just this month, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Director Kelly Sesswin authorized the staff to weekly remove another wolf from the wedge pack and two to three wolves from the lead point pack. So um, even if you don't live in Washington State, please do contact the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and also J Governor Jay Inslee to ask Washington to stop killing wolves. Um, and those links will be posted in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I want to introduce our first speaker, Michael Robinson. Michael Robinson is a senior conservation advocate at the Center for Biological Diversity. He focuses on the protection and recovery of top predators like Mexican gray wolves and jaguars. He's been associated with the center since their founding and joined the staff in 1997. Michael holds a master's degree in literature from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a bachelor's from the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the author a couple well-reviewed books on the history of wolves in the United States, one called Predator Bureaucracy, The Extermination of Wolves and the Transformation of the West. Um, I have that book and I've read it and it's fascinating. <laughs> so over to you, Michael. Hi, thank you, uh, Rachel and Steph and Amanda. Um, I, I am actually only the author of a single book, uh, Predatory Bureaucracy. Is uh, Rachel just mentioned. Um, I'm calling from the ancestral homelands of the Warm Springs Apache people in uh, southern New Mexico. And I'm going to hit share screen here, and I guess I'm not quite able to do that. Um, let's see. You should be able to now. Okay, let's go to this. <clears throat> And I'll be talking about um, the Mexican gray wolf, which is the southernmost uh, and most genetically distinct of the gray wolf subspecies in North America. And it also is the most imperiled. The Mexican gray wolf was called by pioneering ecologist Aldo Leopold the desert wolf in recognition of its arid habitat. Uh, and uh, it's not always in desert, but it's at least in semi-arid uh, semi mountains as well. Uh, the, the story of the Mexican wolf is it's, uh, it is, as I said, a subspecies, but there was a range of different wolf types. Each of these little dots and triangles represents a historical record of gray wolves in the southwest and in Mexico. This is from David E. Brown's book, The Wolf in the Southwest, The Making of an Endangered Species. Um, and you can see there's little dotted lines that indicate uh, subspe at the time thought to be subspecies boundaries, but wolves were continuous, and the Mexican wolf was the smallest uh, and uh, now the most genetically distinct. And the reason for its decline is uh, the same, largely the same as that for other wolves. The livestock industry, the pioneering livestock industry, brooked no opposition, nothing that might imperil maximum production of uh, livestock. This is a, uh, a roadside exhibit that uh, in New Mexico that mentions that in 1919, about the, halfway down is where I'm reading from. During 1919 peak trailing year, 21,677 cattle and 150,000 sheep passed over this trail. So there was a lot more livestock when the land, uh, before the land became depleted. And the livestock industry based in, in the uh, pioneering settlements of, uh, of the Southwest and, and the West initially pushed for wolf bounties that would encourage private individuals to kill wolves because they were seen as onerous and destructive to livestock. But when the bounties failed in their intended purpose of exterminating wolves, because it was a haphazard approach, it was, it was relied on individual action. Uh, there was sometimes fraud involved where other animals would be turned in for wolves. When that failed, the livestock industry persuaded Congress in 1915 to hire hundreds of federal trappers. And these dots represent one, trapper in the early teen years, a hundred and a few years ago, uh, whose job was to kill every wolf in the area to which they were assigned. And secondarily, they were also assigned with killing uh, other predatory animals. In fact, it was a wide, uh, wide ranging program. This is a, a sign that was tacked on a ponderosa pine tree in the San Mateo uh, Mountains, uh, no, sorry, not San Mateo Mountains, Mount Taylor in New Mexico. You can see uh, what it says, United States Department of Agriculture Bureau of Biological Survey, uh, and that agency became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, incidentally. It says, please do not interfere with steel traps in this locality. The government is going to much expense in an effort to exterminate 
the wild animals and the cooperation of the public has desired in seeing that traps of the hunters are not disturbed. So it was official policy to exterminate animals. Poison was widely used. Uh, these are coyotes that, that have been poisoned, but wolves were poisoned as well. And the last wild wolf that was probably born in the Western United States in the, in the 20th century was killed in 1945, 30 years after this federal program began in Southern Colorado, near the border with New Mexico. But wolves still came across from Mexico into the US. This is uh, Animus Mountain in New Mexico's boot heel and the Pelencio Mountains on the border of Arizona and New Mexico and south of there, of course, Mexico. And wolves would come across and the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service by uh, 1940 had acquired this name, uh, had a program of actively killing every wolf that crossed the border, again, on behalf of the livestock industry. And then in, starting in 1950, the US Fish and Wildlife Service began sending poison to the Sierra, to, to officials and cattlemen's associations in Mexico uh, to poison the wolves in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico. And that would have been the end of the Mexican gray wolf, except for the idealism that was beginning in the uh, percolating up in the 1950s and uh, flourishing in the 1960s and had resonance even, even later and today. And you can see President John F. Kennedy, a young congressman who was John uh, Dingle Jr. Uh, from Michigan. And he, during the 1960s, he was working with the Kennedy administration to improve protection of endangered species, i.e. to stop the poisoning by the U.S. government of endangered species. He worked with President Nixon's environmental aide, Russell Train, and eventually managed to pass through Congress with the support of a Republican president, and Dingell, of course, was a, was a Democrat, uh, the Endangered Species Act, with, which President Nixon signed, and whose goal was to conserve endangered species, even if they're inconvenient to us, but also to conserve the ecosystems on which endangered species depend. And uh, the, the ecosystem of the Mexican wolf had been beaten down by livestock, and the wolves had been exterminated uh, by then, but it called for reintroduction and saving, saving the species initially, and, and eventually a recovery plan called for reintroduction. So a total, I'm gonna cut through a lot of detail, but five wolves were captured alive in Mexico between 1977 and 1980 to save the species from extinction. And after 1980, there were none confirmed alive until the 2011 reintroduction occurred. Um, three of those five were successfully bred, and four others from two other lineages of wolves that had been captured, some, and some of them uh, without even any, any clear records of when, uh, were also confirmed later to be, uh, gene through genetic testing, to be Mexican gray wolves. So eventually there was three that were captured between 1977 and 1980, and uh, were interbred with, with the descendants of four others that had been captured in, in previous decades. For a total of just seven founding animals for the Mexican wolf, the early 1982 recovery plan called for breeding them in captivity and reintroducing them to create viable populations in at least two, pop uh, two places in the southwestern United States uh, and in Mexico. But the Fish and Wildlife Service refused to do that. And so conservationists led by uh, Wolf Action Group, uh, which was an ad hoc group of people that uh, later got, uh, that later became the founders of what became the Center for Biological Diversity. This is um, uh, the, was a, one of the predecessor groups for ours, working with uh, the National Audubon Society, Environmental Defense Fund, Sierra Club, and Wilderness Society. We sued the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we got a stipulated settlement in 1993 requiring reintroduction of the Mexican wolf. And that reintroduction began in 1998 with 11 wolves that were released uh, in three family groups in Arizona. So we're now, we're now 22 years into uh, the reintroduction program. Originally, the wolves were confined to this, uh, this area on the border of uh, Arizona and uh, New Mexico that, uh, I guess, Lavender Line uh, shows the delineation of what was the Blue Range wolf recovery area, and there was an experimental population area delineated in that, uh, I don't even know what color to call it, but the larger area between Interstate 40 and Interstate 10 in, in um, both states. Uh, but wolves weren't allowed to set up territories outside um, of the of the smaller area near the center uh, of that map. This is the current range, uh, according to the last flight report that's posted every few weeks by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service of the Mexican wolves. You can see in the center there, uh, in the Gila National Forest and Apache National Forest, and uh, there's there's a, a vertical line representing the state boundary between Arizona and New Mexico. You can see a whole host of orange dots that represent radio-colored wolves. 
and there's a there's a few that are a little bit to the east of there in the San Mateo Mountains, and this is a little closer up of there. Now, some of these dots represent more than one wolf, but you can essentially see the distribution more or less unchanged for the Mexican wolf in at least ten the last ten years. And this is the kind of country that. Uh, that it looks like. Uh, it's, it varies greatly in topography. This is the Gila National Forest, the Elk Mountains, near where, uh, which is where wolves have consistently lived. Even as the numbers of wolves have increased in the 22 years to now 163 animals uh, in the wild, the genetics of the Mexican wolf have declined alarmingly. They're losing genetic diversity from the, from the original seven wolves. The ones in the wild uh, have, have been reduced to, to the equivalent, it's called, there's actually a term of art, founding genomes equivalent, the equivalent of just two wolves as their founders from those original seven. And the ones in captivity still have somewhat more genetic diversity on, akin to three founder genome equivalents. This is a 2007 study that correlated uh, inbreeding or rather lower reproductive success among Mexican gray wolves with greater relatedness uh, among, among the parents. So in other words, wolves that are more inbred are having fewer pups and or fewer of them are, are uh, kept, are able to stay alive during their first year of life. Now those, that initial assessment has been to some extent uh, reversed because the Fish and Wildlife Service extensively feeds the wolves. They feed up to 70%, it varies at any given point, of the, the reproducing wolf packs in the wild uh, as a means to reduce potential conflict with livestock, but it also uh, has the short-term benefit of increasing the, the reproductive success of the wolves, but it also has the, the long-term detriment of not addressing uh, the, the genetic uh, inbreeding that's, that's getting worse uh, that, that is actually um, causing the, the uh, lack of reproductive success. So it treats the symptoms rather than treating the causes. The reason that inbreeding is getting worse is that the livestock industry has essentially seized control of policy making for Mexican wolves. Um, this is a trap set for Mexican wolves. It's a story that happens over and over again. Pups that in a crate dug out uh, because their parents had been ostensibly, probably, killing livestock. Uh, and a plane that was, uh, that was used and has been used over and over again to shoot wolves from the from the air. 16 wolves have been shot by the government since reintroduction uh, began, uh, and an additional uh, 31 wolves, almost twice the 16 that have been shot and killed by the government, uh, have been killed as a direct consequence of their live capture as well. Some of the, uh, the wolves have been very genetically valuable. This is a memo from way back in 2004, um, and you can see in that middle paragraph uh, there, it's in the middle of the, of the paragraph. It says, in the case with M574, they delineate these wolves, denominate them, I should say, by numbers. In the case with M574, he has significant value to the rec recovery program as a whole in that he is the most genetically valuable wolf in the wild. But more significantly, he is ranched, ranked number six genetically overall in the Mexican wolf in the recovery program. It includes both the wild population plus the captive wolves throughout the United States and Mexico. In hindsight, it is questionable that he was ever released to the wild because he is so high ranking, i.e. he is not considered surplus or genetically redundant. Because of this, all attempts should be made to capture him alive. This is a, a Fish and Wildlife Service biologist who wrote this memo to her colleagues and Fish and Wildlife Service followed up by shooting the wolf in question. This kind of management has happened over and over again and the Fish and Wildlife Service is also, if you will, and I'm, uh, they've delegated without saying so, the killing of wolves to others. Now this is the legitimate use by a state biologist, or she might have been a federal biologist, and I believe she's still in the program, of uh, uh, telemetry receivers that, and again, a, uh, a tribal biologist uh, locating the wolves for legitimate management. But the Fish and Wildlife Service has also handed out, like, like it was candy, these receivers to people who do not have the wolves' best interests at heart. And many, many wolves are being killed illegally. Uh, radio collar wolves that are being found and many, many uh, other wolves that are not radio collared or radio collars that are animals that just simply disappear. Uh, do we have a hint as to who may be involved in it? Well, this is from the back cover of the New Mexico Cattle Growers Association. Uh, back just, just in 2017, October 2017, less than, than three years ago, 
Um, and whereas in some, some circumstances they purport to be reasonable about wolves, um, when, when they're you know, speaking amongst themselves, they don't feel the need to be perhaps that, that forthcoming. So uh, here's what they say about wolves belonging. Wolves may belong, but not around my calves. And you can see two wolves that uh, in this artistic depiction have been, have been shot. And interestingly, no sign of any depredations. Um, so anyway, that's the attitude, and the Fish and Wildlife Service has known for a long time that giving out telemetry receivers to people who have openly expressed their disdain for wolves, and sometimes their disdain for the Endangered Species Act and the law that protects the wolves, uh, may be connected to the wolf losses of wolves. Here's an um, email we got from the Freedom of, via the Freedom of Information Act uh, way back in 2007 from the Mexican Wolf Field Coordinator at the time. Attached is the timeline for the likely disappearance of AM and alpha male 5112 of the Aspen pack. Right now, the field team feels that 5112 is dead with the joining of a different wolf to the pack and the timing being peak breeding season. Um, and it goes on about where that pack was located. Uh, we have just given, and then the, they, of course, redact the name. We have just given somebody a receiver just prior to this. So, and then they redact the pronoun, him or her, presumably. So, that person leaving coincidental with the wolves being in the area, co coincidental to uncolored 512 likely being dead, seems questionable. Just a lot of coincidences along the way. Also, the reports and upset people about Aspen, Aspen has died down completely here recently. Thus, I imagine that a few people may know about the deal, and now to just sit quiet and quit complaining about the deal. Anyways, just the ramblings of a suspicious mind at this stage. Nothing to confirm. No body. So this is, okay, it's suspicions, but these uh, radio telemetry receivers, as I said, they've been given out uh, like, like candy, very promiscuously. Here's another email from 2016 about uh, other receivers that will need, be, will need updated. This is from agency biologists, and they list people, uh, livestock owners in the area who will need receivers. You can see the first name on the list is Ron Rains, and then you can see a, a four names down, Craig Thiessen. Well, there haven't been very many convictions of the over 100 wolves that have been illegally killed, plus, plus many dozens or maybe over 100 that have disappeared. But those two names do show up among the very few handful of people who were convicted. Here's a press release from 2011, five years before they were giving out a press a, uh, or updating a telemetry receiver for Mr. Rains. You can see at the bottom of it, Ron Rains. Uh, this is a press release from the U.S. Department of Justice. Two men plead guilty to federal misdemeanor charges related to killing of Mexican gray wolves. Ron Rains, uh, 57, of Reserve in Captain County, New Mexico, was cited for killing a Mexican gray wolf. Uh, he claims he, he misidentified it as a coyote. He, he turned himself in. They know that that's a get-out-of-jail-free card to say, oh, whoops, I thought it was a coyote. Um, and then it says, uh, it says, oops, I'm sorry. Go on. Let me see if I can go back here. Here we go. Um, Court records reflect that two days earlier, two days before killing this animal, Rains had been notified that a wolf was in the vicinity of the area in which he killed the wolf. Okay, so why was five years later was he getting an update to his telemetry receiver to, uh, to locate wolves? Here's another one from uh, after the 2016 uh, memo about this, but another person, Craig Thiessen, who was, uh, was uh, a recipient of a federal telemetry receiver to be able to locate wolves, had trapped a wolf he, uh, he pled guilty, trapped a wolf, killed it with a, a shovel. Now, the other way that the genetics of Mexican wolves have been declining uh, is not just through a lot of killing and removal of wolves, but also through a failure, a refusal of the government to release wolves. Here back in 2005, Fish and Wildlife Service pr proposes restrictions for wolf program, uh, and the restrictions were specifically a one-year moratorium. I'm reading from the second paragraph in the first column. I don't know if you all can see it. Uh, a one-year moratorium on some releases, I, the releases of wolves from captivity to the wild. That was, uh, and the, uh, the, the rationale at the time uh, was that, um, let's see here, uh, that ranchers who were uh, organized by the local congress, my former congressman, Steve Pierce, uh, had said that they wanted a moratorium on releases of wolves uh, because they didn't like the wolves. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service is to send a good message said, okay, we're not going to release wolves for a year. But then the, the, the reasons for not releasing wolves morphed and changed. In 2011, they have a, a press release saying that they're not going to, to uh, release wolves uh, because Arizona Game and Fish wasn't quite in the mood at the time. Uh, then there was a fire that uh, prevented the release of wolves. And there was ostensibly wolves that were all, uncolored wolves that were already 
uh, in an area that they plan to release wolves. In the meantime, the scientific community was urging more releases of wolves. This is a 2007 uh, resolution from the American Society of Mammalogists urging the release of more wolves and looking at the bottom of that uh, right, the, the uh, right-hand co uh, column there, uh, they asked for a suspension of predator control directed at Mexican wolves. They, and this is the next page. They asked for protecting wolves from the consequences of scavenging on livestock carcasses, which is often um, what leads the wolves through proximity or habit or whatever the case may be to, to um, preying on livestock that are nearby when, when there's carcasses of, wolves, of livestock that were not killed by wolves, died of disease or whatever, whatever other cause. In this case, it may, these, uh, this animal at the edge of the Gila National Forest on state for, uh, land uh, may have died from starvation. I don't think there's a blade of grass in, in this picture here. They die of all kinds of reasons. Wolves scavenge on them, and then uh, oftentimes they, they begin preying on livestock. Again, the scientific community has been begging for a long time. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums in 2008, begging for a different types of management, uh, uh, asking that before wolves are removed from the wild, the Fish and Wildlife Service set up um, a, a uh, committee, an expert task force on genetic issues that can provide guidance. Well, this is 2008. Fish and Wildlife Service still has not set up any such committee. Back in 2004, the Center for Biological Diversity, we wrote a petition for rulemaking to get some kind of some, uh, some reforms. We followed up with a lawsuit, uh, and that lawsuit led Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, change the rules. They came out with a draft environmental uh, impact statement. In 2015, they came out with a federal register notice that allowed a lot more wolf, room for wolves to roam, including places for the Fish and Wildlife Service to release wolves for the first time from captivity, uh, captive-born wolves from captivity to the wild in New Mexico in the Gila National Forest. But it also opened, um, and it opened up a lot more areas for wolves to roam, everything uh, within New Mexico and Arizona within that, uh, that, that hatched line. So in other words, south from Interstate 40 down, uh, down to, uh, to the border with Mexico. Um, and although in a, in a phased approach, includes a lot of good habitat, such as the San Mateos, northeast of the Gila National Forest. Um, but it, the phased approach limits when wolves can, can eventually occupy all of these areas, and it limits the very already limited protections that they receive and the ability to release wolves. I won't go into the details about what the restrictions this map represents, but I do want to say that we filed suit against that with many, of, many other conservation groups also alongside the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, and, and anti-conservation, anti-wolf groups uh, representing the livestock industry all filed suit uh, against this 2000, against the Fish and Wildlife Service over, from our perspective, too much wolf killing and not enough wolf releases in the 2015 rule. And in 2018, uh, this, this ruling came out from a judge, um, and I'm just going to read one, one paragraph uh, from, from the ruling. It, came out, it, it uh, ordered the Fish and Wildlife Service to rewrite its management rule uh, and the, the uh, court wrote this. In reaching its conclusions, the court is mindful that when reviewing scientific findings within the, area, within the agency's area of expertise, it is at its most deferential. I'll skip the citations. However, this is not a case in which the agency was required to choose between conflicting scientific evidence. Oops. Between conflicting scientific evidence. On the contrary, the best available science consistently shows that recovery requires consideration of long-term impacts, particularly the subspecies genetic health. Moreover, this case is unique in that the same scientists that are cited by the agency publicly communicated their concern that the agency misapplied and misinterpreted findings in such a manner that the recovery of the species is compromised. To ignore this dire warning was an egregious oversight by the agency. So uh, that's what a judge found looking objectively at the evidence. Uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service is now engaged in rewriting it, and they, um, I want to just focus on one thing. This is from our comments, uh, Center for Biological Diversity's comments, um, quoting from, from Fish and Wildlife Service uh, documents in us urging that they begin to uh, release wolves once again as family units, which is something they last did in 2006. Ever since then, they either released wolves that had been quickly paired together with another wolf, and they often left each other after this quick pairing and release, or they've been releasing neonatal, newborn wolves taken from captivity, taken from their mothers, and placed in uh, wild wolves' dens, which they call cross-fostering. And um, 
what we pointed out is uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm sorry, I'm, my own screen here is, I can't see my entirety of my screen, um, but I want to point out that, that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service had said they consider an, a successful initial release of any Mexican wolf uh, to have a success rate of 21%, and that's if the wolf uh, eventually ends up, their, their criteria for success is that the wolf eventually produces pups in the wild, regardless of how many pups or whether they survive, if they produce pups in the wild. They say 21% uh, success altogether. Um, but they have, uh, for, for cross-fostering of wolves, they've thus far through 2016 through 2018, which are the, the, the dates from, from uh, which you can have wolves that have actually lived long enough to be able to successfully reproduce. In other words, they've gotten to be at least two years old. Uh, they've cross-fostered 18 pups from captivity to the wild, and just four of those 18 are, are known to be alive. Uh, and only one of them is known to have successfully reprodu reproduced. So if they're gonna reach their 21% average success rate with this experimental, unproven taking of, of newborn pups and placing them in the dens of wild wolves, unrelated wild wolves, they're gonna have to actually, uh, hopefully we're gonna see all the remaining three of those four animals that are known to be alive successfully reproduce if they're just gonna reach the criteria they've set. In other words, they have an experimental method that is thus far not, uh, not doing as well as releasing wolves as family groups, which makes sense when we're talking about a social animal. Why take these animals uh, from, their, from their parents and place them with unrelated animals. The good news is we have wolves out there in the wild. The bad news is their genetic status is declining. Fish and Wildlife Service also wrote a recovery plan, again, because of litigation. Um, and that also, because of the recovery plan that was developed in 2017 to replace the original 1982 recovery plan, was so badly politicized, we have gone to court against it. Uh, this is a peer-reviewed article that points out many of the ways in which it was politicized, very subtle ways in which the new recovery plan tweaked uh, the parameters and the assumptions. I don't think I've got enough time to go through this, but I just want to um, I, I want to point out that uh, the re Mexican wolf recovery team appointed by the Fish and Wildlife Service developed their own recovery plan that would have required three populations of wolves with at least 750 wolves altogether as a criteria for delisting, but the recovery plan that was eventually developed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, that was essentially, the Fish and Wildlife Service essentially transcribed, it's a slight exaggeration, but not, not much of one, transcribed the instructions from anti-wolf game departments, such as Arizona Game and Fish Department, uh, which has fought against wolf uh, recovery for a long, long time, and they came out with criteria that they, uh, they only need a total of 320 wolves in the U.S. and an unconnected population of wolves in, uh, in Mexico as well. In, in other words, wolves might not be able to reach each other. And of course, as, as we're gonna hear later this afternoon, uh, we have a very dire situation with a wall being built on the border. So we, we filed suit against that as well. Uh, that suit has not yet been resolved, but I wanna point out uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Service, in its defense, this is from one of their, um, their, their briefs, uh, they took issue with the notion that their recovery plan actually had to be based on science. And this is from a footnote. Plaintiffs also rely on a different case, Fund for Animals, for their assertion that recovery plans must be based on the best available science. And then they go on to argue that actually no, recovery plans aren't, uh, don't need to be. So instead of defending the science on which the recovery plan is based, they're basically saying we don't have to do it. In the meantime, here's another study, vitrification of oocytes from endangered gray, Mexican gray wolves. Essentially what it's about is the fact that the genetics are so dire that they're now freezing the eggs of live Mexican wolves in the hope that technology that has not yet been invented sometime in the future will enable the development of, of wolves, you know, live wolves from these frozen eggs of, of Mexican wolves because the genetics are going so bad they want to preserve what little genetics are available. So the question I come to is, are we at the dawn of a new era, era of Mexican gray wolf recovery or, or is this really sunset for the Mexican gray wolf? Will future generations have a chance to uh, see wolf tracks in the mud in, in the Southwest? Will they be able to hear wolves howling? I don't know what the answer to that is, but the Fish and Wildlife Service from the very outset has, has been opposed to Mexican wolves. The Center for Biological Diversity and many of our allies and the vast majority of the American public in the Southwest who've 
uh, and I think the public overall wants to see these uh, these animals survive. And anyway, um, I'm glad to uh, be talking with y'all. I wish, I wish, of course, that we were able to be part of a conference uh, face to face, but I'm happy to open it up to any questions that people may have.